Based cities also need to emphasise local food and there are farmers markets growing dramatically around the world. This is a little billboard just outside here that talks, shows the, uh, the local produce that was um, around in the early part of the century in Edmonton. One of the keys to place is the, is the land-water interface. It's very primor primordial and this kind of engineering is really on the outer now and how you can create creeks, daylighting of creeks is very important. The best example of all is this uh, amazing transformation in Seoul where the river underneath that, which was a sacred river for the people, um, was obliterated by this massive engineering works and when an election was held on the basis of removing that, the person who put up his hand and said, I will stand for removing that, just happened to be the engineer who'd built it. It was an extraordinary story. But he got elected. You can imagine him going to the traffic engineer and saying, OK, bring it down. And they did, and created the six kilometre long, amazing local park that is um, uh, sh so popular in that city. He's now the president of Korea, so it doesn't hurt your politics. <laughs> Finally, the sustainable transport city, which is what I want to spend a bit more time on. Car dependence is not smart. It's not sustainable either, we know that, but it's also not smart. A and sprawl is now beginning to die. Public transport can double, biking and walking can triple, and we can reduce car use 50%. That is my uh, prediction of what we can do in our cities. The other 50% will need to be electric vehicles as part of new smart centres. That's my message on this. Now these kind of areas, the, the subprime mortgage areas, many of which have been abandoned in US cities, uh, indicate that that kind of urban planning where you scatter land use around is, is no longer acceptable. And that uh, uh, piece of uh, email that went around the world uh, in the last few days that US cities will be bulldozing parts of them to, to survive is uh, an extraordinary uh, time to think that we have got to that point. These kind of suburbs that we keep rolling out are not very smart, they're not sustainable, they're not smart because they don't have centres relating to the new economy. They're essentially shopping centres and houses and the, the new economy is elsewhere. It's fed by urban highways. Now I think it's a major turning point we've reached in the world because almost no city is now building urban highways. This I think is probably the last major US urban highway, the Katy Freeway in Houston. You can see the, the lone star on every pylon. It costs $100 million a mile to build and it's 20 lanes wide in places. This um, exhausts a city and Los Angeles hasn't built an urban freeway for 20 years. And when you look at why, you would expect freeway miles to reduce delay, but there is no correlation between the amount of freeway miles built and the amount of delay in cities. They fill so quickly, they are just not working. And it's obvious why, because you can take that many cars and replace it with three buses or one light rail, and you create enormous space savings. Space is money. Space is greenhouse gases that can be saved. This is smart and this is more sustainable. We have begun to build a lot more transit now in Australian cities and Perth was one of the leading uh, cities in it because we had a political movement. This Southern Railway was opened last year. It's now carrying 55,000 a day compared to the buses which were carrying 14,000. It's nearly double what was predicted in the patronage and it was paid off before it opened because it was so popular. 
the Southern Rail is significant because it goes right to those outer suburbs that all the transport planners say don't deserve a railway. They're, not, they're too scattered, the, they were built around the car, this is not appropriate to build a railway. They won't use it. They won't get out of their single occupant vehicle. Well, they did. And overall, Perth has, um, which is very similar to Edmonton in style of city and economy, actually, has moved very quickly from 7 million passengers a year to 90 million in a 15-year transition. We're not alone. Each Australian city is now growing dramatically in public transport. It's basically full. There no, no one's advertising anymore for people to use public transport. And the dramatic uh, increases have got through. And the Infrastructure Australia board that I'm on, we compared rail, road and bus projects on the table at the same time. And rail came out top so often. It was clearly better. Now, it's very rare to do that in any jurisdiction. I can recommend it. Rail will do well. And so we uh, spent $4.6 billion announced in the last few weeks on urban rail from a government that has never funded urban rail before. The same trends are seen around the world. 12.9% growth in Indian railways. Chinese railways went up 85 in the UK, 10.8%. They're building railways everywhere. And probably the most amazing thing in the US, car use is in decline. And it began in the last five years before the crash, before the fuel price increase. Because people, younger people especially, were coming back into the cities. The smart uh, moves were, were, were to base yourself where there was better public transport. I never thought I'd live to see this kind of graph. If you want hope, if you want to see some genuine change, have a look at that. Dramatic increases in public transport in the US. 7% growth in light rail and declines in car use. Now that makes a big difference because you can begin to take road space away and use it for public transport major political issue for most of you in local government. But that is the, the future. Now, when you look at the data, and you, this is going to be far too hard for you to look at, but the, um, the black cities there, the US cities, uh, and Atlanta and Houston and Denver and so on, massive uh, car dependence. The Canadian, Australian cities are the blue ones. About half the car usage. And the European cities, half again. Barcelona down there has about eight gigajoules per capita compared to Atlanta at 103, with similar wealth levels. Enormous variations. Cities like Singapore, Tokyo, Hong Kong, between five and eight. So there are huge differences across the world, and you can see the cities that need to change. They are very vulnerable, those cities on the left. And the pub public transport usage patterns dramatically different. And the black cities on the right, they're almost off the scale. They're so tiny. And the worst one of all is Phoenix. Just this year, Phoenix took out a lane of traffic in each direction and put in a new light rail. That is hard to do in any city, but particularly in a city that has no public transport history, because the people voted for it. And so we are beginning a transition. And if there's any hope in this world, it is to see that Phoenix is building light rail. Um, Edmonton's light rail was one of the first in Canada. It's now getting to the point, and this week, the, the City Council will, will vote on, uh, on a major extension to their light rail, tripling the system in the next few decades, showing how they can rebuild around that. And most importantly, linking land use through centres along those rail lines. This is the focus of the urban regeneration that they will be looking to. And that is a major factor. You don't just put rail in. You need to build around it and you need to facilitate that. And that comes down to local government. And in some places local government don't do this well. In other places they do it well. And it really works. The combination is dramatic. My new mantra is Todd, Pod and God. Todd is transit-oriented development. 
and 